Welcome to today's podcast. Hi, everybody. Um, today we're doing a podcast on addiction, and I'm Dr. Amanda Vandeveer, and I'm joined today by Marcy Childs, uh, LCPC and therapist at CABS, uh, to help us understand addiction a little bit better. So addiction has become very much more present in our society. It seems like uh, we all have someone in our life that fits the definition of someone with an addiction. Um, and, and we have that personal experience seeing people who have struggled with addiction. So I just think it would be important to know what science and research has to tell us about addiction. So what are the signs that I may be becoming addicted to something? Well, the signs actually break down along physiological, genetic, psychological, and then what we call social environment factors. Um, the more physiological would be tolerance and withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, do you notice that, let's say if you're talking about alcohol, that you need a little bit more to get the same effect that you used to get? Um, are you noticing withdrawal symptoms when you don't drink alcohol? Uh, for a lot of people that might be like having shaky hands in the yeah. morning or um, profuse sweating, having like dry heaves throughout yeah. the day. Um, well, even a hangover is really a withdrawal, right? Right, right. Yeah. In a sense, that's it. That's like a little mini withdrawal yeah. withdrawal session. Um, some of the, the social and environmental um, factors would be, are you failing to meet obligations that you normally should be meeting? whether that's with school, with work, with family, friends. Um, also, are you hiding? Are you hiding your use of alcohol or any other substance? Do you feel like it's something that you don't want people in your family or, or social network to see and to know that you're engaging in? Yeah. Have you tried to quit before and not been successful? That's another big one. Oh. Um, if you've tried to cut down and ultimately had to go back to using then that's a little question of, okay, is there something a little bit more going on here? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we have genetic, you know, ties to, um, we know there's a, a hereditary component for a lot of people. Um, we do have populations that are more susceptible to alcoholism, yeah. specifically. Um, indigenous people, Native Americans, have a strong propensity toward a genetic mutation mm -hmm. that doesn't allow them to metabolize alcohol at the same rate that a lot of other groups are able to. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be a little more prone to actually developing a full-blown addiction to something like that. Also women, we, um, we don't metabolize alcohol at the same rate that a man would. Um, and it all has to do with this enzyme called ADH. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the things that you, you, know, you wanna think about when you're thinking about addiction and the potential for it as well as like what are some of the signs that I might be addicted yeah and there's a lot going on with that too so um what are some warning signs that I may be moving towards addiction like is there a line that I cross and I can't come back now like say for developing diabetes or is it something that you can come back and maybe safely use again how does that work it kind of depends on the theory or the, theor <laughs> the theoretical approach yeah. you're coming from. Some yeah. people say you can re return to using, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, alcohol, cannabis, whatever it is, um, socially on occasion. For some people that seems to work, for other people not so much. Yeah. So on that part of that question, it's going to be a, a big, it depends. It depends on who you are and mm -hmm. what you've got going on. Yeah. Absolutely. That Absolutely. And then in terms of how to know if you're moving toward um, I guess what you call like a, a clinical level of addiction or mm -hmm. substance use disorder. Um, I think that the norm is, I believe it's 15 drinks a week for men, eight for women. Sorry ladies, but we mm -hmm. just can't drink as much. That's where they start to define it as problem use. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, watching yourself for binge drinking behaviors. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest issue we, we face in, with college oh, drinking. Yeah. Um, by far, and there are so many more safety considerations with that kind of use. Mm -hmm. Binge drinking, the definition is literally just drinking to get drunk. Yeah. Um, for some people, that's blackout drunk. Um, 
Yeah, and so, that's a sign that you might be going towards an addiction too, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah, because if you notice yourself, say you're going to parties and somebody's handing you a red cup, it's awfully hard not to take the red cup, right? Yeah. And so I think for a lot of our students, they end up kind of um, unintentionally stumbling into some problem use, particularly with alcohol. And before they know it, it's kind of caught up with them. Yeah. And so they notice they're drinking a little more and a little more. Um, and very quickly, health consequences can follow. Mm -hmm. Academic consequences are usually huge. Yeah. And social consequences, And too. there's different stages with that. Like you, you start, you might be a social drinker, and then it can progress right. further along. Right. And that's where you look for some of those things I was mentioning earlier. You know, do you notice that you're needing to take a drink when you're at home alone before you go to class just to get through class without feeling shaky and irritable and that sort of thing? Do you notice that friends or family are commenting and saying, you know, we're a little worried. We've seen you drinking quite a bit lately. Um, and then you start kind of like hiding it or lying about it. Yeah. That's kind of like where where you can start to see, okay, this, this may not just be social drinking when I go out right. to parties. I may be in a, a little bit more hot water with this. Yeah, if you need to use when you get up in the morning or or, or drink or something like that, then that's getting into your daily function. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that can be a real big sign. Um, so what can someone do to prevent getting addicted? Uh, check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> Oh. One of my favorite sayings and an 80s song yeah. lyric, which great absolutely great reference. philosophy. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Check yourself. Look through. it up, guys. Just Google it. Google it. Yeah. Um, no, and, and have friends who can who can check you. It is hard yeah. when you get in the moment and you're at a party and you bring your group of friends who are going to keep you safe mm -hmm. and keep you honest, don't let you drink, leave, leave your drink, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. It can be trickier because of social pressures and psychological factors mm -hmm. that we don't have time to get into. Yeah, It can be tricky for those people to call you out on your drinking behavior or to even notice it. They're at the party too, so don't assume that they're going to be able to watch out right. for you the entire time. Um, the best way to avoid it is don't drink daily, mm -hmm. don't binge drink, um, and binge drinking is, I believe, four to five drinks for a man on occasion, two to three for a woman, yeah. um, and drinking occasion meaning, you know, an evening out or what have you. Yeah. Um, definitely try to avoid the binge drinking because I think, and again, I think for our student population, that's probably one of the bigger risks that can lead to developing a full-blown problem. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you're talking about binge drinking like if I go out and drink five or six on a, on a Friday night like is that safe <laughs> this is like the, the, the therapist in me and the mom in me oh. <laughs> are both yeah. fighting a little bit right now I would say no simply because that falls into that binge drinking yeah. category um and that's where we do see you know your inhibitions go down don't forget that when you're college age, your frontal lobes aren't fully developed right. yet. So you don't have that brake system that's going to yeah. say, oh, no, I shouldn't get in the car and drive, you know, while I'm drunk. Um, add alcohol, and that's going to lower your inhibitions further. So we find, you know, a lot of students end up in car accidents, mm -hmm. um, sexual assaults yeah. skyrocket with binge drinking. Um, so I never recommend that. I mean, I know the idea is, yeah, let's get drunk and have fun, but I don't know that it's worth it. It's it's very unsafe for mm -hmm. like many reasons, like the, the environmental reasons that you're talking about, but also it's really hard on your body. It's a poison. People don't understand. Alcohol is a poison. Wine is a poison. Every time they say, oh, wine's so healthy for you drink grape juice. It's way healthier and it does the same thing. It has all the same Yes, it has all the good and things and none of the bad with the killing your liver off. Because you need your liver. You need your liver. And you need your brain. You don't yes. want like, the wet brain syndrome or whatever yes, they call no, it. No, no, you don't want no. Yeah. That, that's bad. Lots of health consequences yeah. with alcohol. Yeah. So if I've come to the point in my life where I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I have a problem. How do I recover? Ah, uh, 
again, it depends. There are a couple mm-hmm. of different approaches to recovery. Yeah. The traditional route has been the 12 step, what we mm-hmm. call the medical model. Um, and most recovery centers, particularly in areas like this that aren't mm-hmm. necessarily, you know, more forward with like the most modern treatments and stuff. Yeah. Um, most recovery programs are based on that yeah, that they model. Have twelve step facilities. Right, they'll have yeah. mm-hmm, they'll and a lot of them will have meetings right there in the yeah. in the facilities. Um, and twelve step has some real benefits to it, um, particularly the fellowship with community yeah, and yeah. that sort of thing. There are others who practice what we call a harm reduction model mm-hmm. of recovery. Um, I think generally you will find and and. Nothing is a solid bet. You'll get variations in treatment approaches. Yeah. And again, it should be based on you and your individual mm-hmm. needs, your individual um, desires. But generally speaking, in the 12-step community, you'll find more of an abstinence-only approach yeah. to all substances. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in a harm reduction approach, you look at some folks who do like what we call California sober. That yeah. might be yeah. stepping away from alcohol mm-hmm. or opiates or benzos and maybe smoking cannabis yeah. or microdosing. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- th- there's a variety of treatment approaches out there. Yeah, um, It's just a matter of finding what, what works best for each person. Yeah, and, and if you are going to use the, the Californian program, <laughs> like that would be important to use under the supervision of a doctor who knows what the side effects are and uh, because microdosing could go horribly wrong. It could. And don't go to Dr. YouTube. No. Don't go to Dr. YouTube. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Consult with a, with a medical professional, with a license and all those good yes. things. Yes, yes. So what are the signs that like maybe my family member or my friend is having problems and needs some needs intervention? Some yeah, I mean, it's, it's essentially, you know, do you see them changing behaviors or daily habits in a significant way. Mm-hmm. Is this somebody who used to go out for a jog when they got home from work, but now you notice they don't go out jogging anymore, but they're up in their yeah. room with a bottle of wine, or you know, you just you start to look for like those little changes in behavior. Also are they hiding their their use mm-hmm. of alcohol, cannabis, yeah. whatever the whatever the substance is? Um, are they struggling financially in a way that they mm-hmm. maybe weren't before? Yeah. Um, I've experienced the hiding with with people that I know that are living in addictions, and they often think that they're getting away with it. Like, oh, nobody can smell that I've just downed a bottle of gin. I'll just use a breath mint. Mm. That does not work. <laughs> it smells like minty gin. Yes. 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 That yes. does. Smell Very like. minty gin. Yes. Yeah. I've I've dealt with the same thing with family mm-hmm. members, and you know, I I think there's this certain hubris that comes along with that yeah, sort of thing yeah. where you think you're getting away with a lot more than maybe you're getting away with. Yeah. Um, I think that's just because we're scared to say something. You know, we just want to keep everything good because it's a family member or a friend that we care about and we don't want to confront them, but, sure. but that perpetuates the addiction. It definitely can. And tends to perpetuate the person's idea that, oh, I must be getting away with it. Nobody right. said anything. Yeah. So this is a good enough place to hide my bottle and, and glass. Yeah. So now I can drink and drive and pop a mint and the police will not find They'll out. They'll never know. They'll never know. So yeah, that could end really bad mm-hmm. if we continue to cover it up and, and just go along to get along. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any other signs that you would think of that, um, that we could look for in our friends and family? Um, one other thing that you might look for mm-hmm. is uh, along the lines of are they changing their daily habits and behaviors? Are they isolating themselves more? Oh, yeah. um, and do you notice maybe more moodiness? Mm-hmm. So like particularly like irritability and agitation um, and particularly around times when maybe they're not able to get that drink or smoke or whatever it is that they do. Are you kind of noticing some changes in attitude that you might not have seen with that person before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So how do I talk to someone I care about? Because I don't want to confront my family member or my friend and have them, you know, cut me off and and just walk away. Um, But how can I nicely say, hey, you might want to look at this? Yeah. 
that's tricky because I think yeah, for most of us, the, the fear of the blowback, mm -hmm. the fear of being wrong. What if we approach them and it doesn't turn out that they're struggling with any sort of substance use disorder? There's a lot there. Yeah. If we're talking about parents, my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm yeah. To your parents Confronting about. your parent about something yeah. like that where you have a concern. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people are familiar with interventions. Yeah. Um, the TV show on oh, yeah, show. I'm a yeah. huge fan. I love to watch intervention. But I also understand from from the research I've read, yeah. they can be problematic. Yeah, they're not very um, effective at all. Sadly. Yeah, that's unfortunately my experience. I, I honestly believe if... First of all, make sure you're not in the heat of a moment. Right. Make sure emotions aren't high, yours or theirs. Mm -hmm. Try to catch them when they're sober, they're not using, what have you. Try to sit down and have an honest conversation where you're coming from a place of caring, where you're able to be genuine with your concern and where you're able to be empathic and listen to them, mm -hmm. actively listen to them yeah. about what's been going on for them. Yeah that's much less likely to raise their defenses because let's face it the first thing all of us do when somebody comes to us and says you're you're doing this yeah. i saw that no finger pointing we're going to sit down we're going to have a conversation and i'm coming from a place of love and support i noticed lately that you know you've been drinking a little more wine and i'm kind of concerned about how things are going for you you know can you share with me what's been going on and, and yeah. where you're at with that yeah, that's a really good way to phrase it. And I think using empathy and mindfulness in interacting with the person and trying to, you know, focus on being calm and, and get your point across that you love and care about the individual and you're just trying to check on them, yes. basically. Yeah, where I'm checking in. I'm checking in because I love you and I care about you. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great way to put it. And we, we also have um, podcasts that we've done on empathy and mindfulness that you guys can check into. Um, so you were going to say something? I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, okay. I let it go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> let it go. Um, so that's really important, I think, because I, I always focus on what happens if this person dies from this addiction and I've never said anything. Mm -hmm. What happens if I never spoke up? That's what I have to think about. Like, am I, am I willing to lose this person if that's what it comes down to? If it means that maybe they seek help for their issue and find a way to live happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that's really what we have to get to when we're ready to confront somebody and say, hey, I think you have a problem. Can you talk to me about what's going on, like you said? So it's almost like the pain yeah. and regret of that challenge and that confrontation yep. would end better with that person alive versus the pain yes. and regret of not challenging them and they end up, God forbid, passing away or, yeah, or suffering absolutely. some major medical issue. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would definitely rather them be healthy and hate me for the rest of their lives as long as they have the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. Um, so what resources are there on campus for people who are concerned about addictions, whether it be personally or for family and friends? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the safe office is mm -hmm. a good start. Yeah. CAPS, we're a good yeah. start. Yeah. <laughs> we actually do yeah. have, because I haven't been working there that long, mm -hmm. so I did do a little resource digging just to mm -hmm. see what we had available in terms of like screening instruments. Yeah, It's amazing. We have... We have ways of, of using screening instruments to help you know if a friend is suffering with a problem, yeah. just based on your report. We have, of course, screening instruments to help you know if you have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you have licensed uh, counselors and therapists there yeah. who know how to diagnose these things. Because it can be hard to know, okay, where am I at on the spectrum of problem drinking or use? Yeah. You know, is this something that I can get out ahead of myself? Have I not quite gotten to that point where I'm feeling the physiological effects of tolerance and withdrawal so that I need like medical assistance to go through that, yeah. that process? Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely hit up CAPS um, and the SAFE office, I think, are the, the two yeah. biggest areas that I would, uh, would look into. Yeah, we have a lot of great resources on the SAFE office website that you can check into. There's a self-screening that you can use um, and uh, there are other options there too, so you can check that out. 
Uh, so what resources are available off campus to the public? Yeah, again, we live in an area with limited resources, <laughs> but we do have a, a couple that are, are a real help for folks, especially as you're kind of starting to look into this and if you have no experience with this sort of thing, a number one go-to for me always is the health department. Yeah. They are your ultimate resource for mental and behavioral health and for just about every other health-related resource yeah. you can imagine. Um, that's a great place to start. Um, typically, it's cost-free, just depending mm -hmm. on you know various like residency yeah. matters and stuff. Um, also, there's the Western Maryland Intergroup mm -hmm. is what it's called, and that is the it, it, it's sponsored by the AANA community. Mm -hmm. Um, they have a website. I don't know the exact website off the top of my head, but I know if you Google Western Maryland Intergroup, yeah. it's a weird word, but um, there are so many meetings yeah. in the Allegheny County area. And, and meetings, look, you may not know if you're struggling or not, but it can't hurt to maybe go to a meeting and see where some other people are at and kind of judge, okay, is this yeah. where I'm at with this? They have meetings just for women. They have they have meetings for friends and family members yeah. of people struggling. Yeah. So th there's just kind of an endless selection of different, you know, setups for that sort of yeah. thing. Honestly, those are the places I would start in this area. Yeah, and there's people. great um, online meetings now too. With the the horrors of the pandemic, one of the good things that came out of it is online AA meetings. So you can literally go to a meeting. Any time of day, anywhere you're at, as long as you have internet access. Mm -hmm. So you can access to that through aa.org or na.org. You get the pattern, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, there's tons of meetings available. Well, and two, I should mention, like, huh? that with AANA meetings, no one is going to ask you to show them a diagnosis of substance right. use disorder yes, when you open really the good door. Point. Yeah, it, that, and that's what I was trying to say. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter where you're at with it. Nobody's yeah. going to question, well, do you have an addiction? Because you really yeah. shouldn't be here if you don't have a diagnosed substance use disorder. Right. That just doesn't happen. Yeah, there's um, no beat. All are welcome in that environment. Yeah. So. so you can go in. I've had former students of mine where I've required them for an addictions class to go and sit in an Al-Anon Al meeting or an AA meeting or an NA meeting to experience it. So, so you can go as long as the meeting is open. You can go. It, anybody off the street can go. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't require you to stand there and say, "Hi, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic," or right. anything like that. Right. Yeah. I think yeah. we get an idea from the movies and from yeah. media about what these meetings look yeah. like. Um, some of them are a little more accurate than others, mm -hmm. I think, having been to a few of them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and you brought up another good point. Some meetings are what they call closed. Mm -hmm. um, those are meetings that do not just welcome anyone in from the right. community. It is a very set group of people that are moving mm -hmm. through it together, and people from the outside just aren't welcomed at those. Um, the meetings folks would want to look for what are called open meetings. Yeah. So. yeah, for the closed meetings, it's more people who have already identified as, yes, this is my problem, right. and this is what I need to fix. Right. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, we also have um, uh, the podcast that we just did on recovery that James just did with us. Uh, so you guys can check that out. I wanted to bring that up. And is there anything else you would like to add about addictions and campus college community? No, I think, you know, I will say this. We, we've known for a while now that a, a lot of college students assume that their fellow college students are drinking a yes. lot more than they actually are. Yes. Um, I believe it's somewhere around... 20% of college students actually would meet criteria for a substance use mm -hmm. disorder. It is a prevalent issue on college campuses. Um, the propensity to fall into problem drinking. Yeah. College students also have more of a tendency to develop problem drinking than mm -hmm. their peers who don't go to college. Yeah. So there's a lot to do with the culture. There's a lot to do with expectations. You know, if that student thinks everybody is drinking, well, I'm gonna drink yeah. too, that's what we do, right? Um, and it's convenient if you're around people who are drinking all the time. It's convenient to say, yeah, everybody's drinking on yeah. campus, but that's not how it really is. Yeah. And I used to have a professor who would say, if you have a brain, you're capable of becoming addicted to a substance. Yes. There are 
factors that might make you more prone to an addictive issue. Um, but starting with the very basic, we all have brains so we can all become addicted. Mm -hmm. College students are dealing with, and particularly Gen Z, mm -hmm. with some factors that I feel like predispose them a little, maybe even a little more than yeah. than students in years past. So, yeah, it's especially the trauma that, that we've all been yes. through and stuff like yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's it's something to to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Be careful. Yeah. Be careful. That makes sense. So thank you, Marcy, for sharing with us about addictions um, and giving us a better understanding on how to deal with addiction if it happens in our lives. Because unfortunately, statistics, it seems like addictions are on the rise and we're going to be impacted by it at some point. And thank you all for watching today. Um, uh, we hope this podcast on addictions has brought you some education about it and some knowledge. And if you have any questions, please stop by the SAFE office or the CAPS office. Please come and talk to us. We are more than willing to help. And we also have plenty of resources for you on our website. So please check that out. Um, so thank you all for watching and have a good day, y'all. Thank you for being a part of our podcast. This health and wellness podcast is brought to you by the Prevention Center and Peer Education Network at Frostburg State University. If you would like more information about our programs, visit us in Colon Hall 109 or call us at 301-687-4761. Or you could also send us an email at safeoffice at frostburg.edu.